Hello, and uh, welcome as we come once again to look at the upcoming scripture for what uh, technically is the 18th Sunday of the year, but because it happens to fall on the 6th of August, it falls on the traditional uh, celebration of the transfiguration of the Lord. And so the liturgy we will be looking at <clears throat> will uh, use text which uh, revolve, or resol revolve around that particular mystery. Now, uh, part of the kind of consideration here is, and we will look at some aspects of this particular feast and maybe a little bit of its history in our tradition, but the second Sunday of Lent is also the Sunday in which you might remember we also consider the transfiguration of the Lord. So we'll look at some aspects perhaps of this mystery that we uh, did not or were not able to cover or maybe review a little bit some things if you go back to, the, uh, to that particular Sunday. Now the reason why this uh, particular mystery in Jesus' life, namely the Transfiguration, is celebrated on the 6th of August, has a little bit of history. Apparently the feast originally originated in the East, that would be in the Orthodox Church, and was widely celebrated before the end of the first millennium. But in the Western tradition, that would be our tradition, the feast was not uh, introduced until Pope Callistus III in the year 1457 introduced the feast <clears throat> in thanksgiving for the victory of the Christians over the Turks at Belgrave on July the 22nd of 1456. But news of this victory did not reach Rome until August 6th and uh, so that's why the feast is observed on this particular day. The feast is celebrated not only in the Roman Church, the Western Church, but also in the Russian and Greek Orthodox churches. It's celebrated in the Church of England and it's celebrated in the Episcopal Church here in the United States. So I, all of that is a little bit of a background as to why August 6th turns out to be uh, this day and why it replaces the usual uh, Sunday uh, reading, which would be, and I just mention it in passing, which would be from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. We will not be looking at that, but I just want to mention that in passing. The scripture readings that we will be consideration considering first comes from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, and then verses 13 and 14. The second reading comes from the second letter attributed to Peter, chapter 1, verses 16 through 19, and then the gospel reading is from Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. So all of that is a little bit of a... Of a a background of the feast and now the readings. It pictures uh, Jesus as being transfigured on a mountain. Now we now have a number of speculations as to exactly what this mountain is. Uh, in the year 340, uh, the writer Eusebius, who was one of the early important Christian writers of history, uh, said that the mountain could have been either Mount Tabor or Mount Hermon. Um, the pilgrim of Borduk, who visited here in uh, Israel in 333, claimed that it was the Mount of Olives. So, at least in the early times, we have three possible uh, sightings for what is this mountain. Always keep in mind that biblically, mountain refers to a height and is thought to be a place where the gods dwelt. Remember also the uh, kind of chronology or 
of understanding of the world is that you had three levels. You had the heavens, you had the earth, and you had the underworld, and that a mountain seemed to be uh, almost that place which would touch the heavens. Obviously, they did not think of the cosmology of our world as we do today, but rather have to treat it as was understood in those uh, days. Now, um, it was the Bishop of uh, Jerusalem, Cyril, who in 348 of the common time, declared that it was Tabor that was the mountain that Jesus uh, went up with, with his three special disciples, Peter, James, and uh, John. So all of that is why today uh, the uh, Tabor is considered to be uh, that place. Now, as far as how it was reckoned, this is a little bit of church history before we get into the scripture itself. Um, apparently that there uh, was a, a building, a basilica, we are told by a visitor, an anonymous uh, pilgrim, uh, in the year 570, said that there was that there were three basilicas. Now, um, a little bit later, that clarification that would be in the year 723. Getting all these dates and backgrounds here um, claims that there was really just one basilica with um, well, two kind of uh, side altars, if you want, and. The um, monks, Benedictine monks, uh, built a place, or a, actually for their own residence there in the uh, 1000s, 1099 to be exact, but they uh, were unfortunately, those monks who lived there were massacred and their building destroyed but when the Turks attacked it in 11, uh, 1113. They returned to build a monastery there at the end of the 1100s, 1183, and so there is a presence on that uh, particular, uh, on the hill of uh, Tabor, uh, honoring uh, the Transfiguration. It was during the time of the Fourth Crusaders which took place during the 1200s, 1202 to 1204, that a facility was built there. Now, I give all of this background because over the years, uh, some kind of church w w would be there. The current one, the one that is there today, a basilica, was built in 1924. And um, in many ways, it represented a Byzantine a style church. You see a picture here of the, uh, of the church itself. In the center is a, a uh, artist, artistic uh, drawing of Jesus ascending uh, to heaven. Or is it Jesus being transfigured? And we'll talk a moment about whether or not this uh, event occurred before uh, Jesus' entrance into the city of Jerusalem or whether it was and is a resurrection story. Hence why when you see Jesus, he is kind of lifted up in a kind of resurrected period. On the two side chapels, one on either side, is one um, dedicated to Moses, of course, who is the giver of the law, and the other to Elijah, who of course is the prophet. So it's an interesting uh, church today or basilica that houses the remembrance of the transfiguration. Now, uh, going back a moment to what I mentioned in, in, in question of interpretation, some thought or think that this particular episode is a misplaced account of the resurrection. Therefore, it should appear uh, after the stories of Jesus' death and um, passion and death. Others claim <laughs> that this account is a mystical experience that Jesus' disciples had in his presence. Well, all right, when did that happen? 
And then the third interpretation, that it is a, a symbolic account devised by Matthew or the tradition which is connected with Matthew's gospel and literally belongs to an episode in Jesus' life before he entered the city of Jerusalem. And that seems to, de to be today the generally accepted interpretation. So this particular event, and I kind of smile, gets a, a, a number of different interpretations. It might be important to notice in the end that this is a literary device developed by Matthew to encourage and strengthen his disciples as he is moving on to Jerusalem and the events that are going to happen in Jesus' life. The, now, all of that occurs on a mountain, therefore uh, we can expect some kind of presence of, uh, of the Lord on Mount Tabor. Now, backing up a moment, Mount Tabor itself has an interesting history. In the uh, Hebrew Bible, or in the, in the Old Testament, it was near the Mount of Tabor. When we go to the book of Judges, that we find that the uh, Israelites defeated the army of the king of Azor under the hands of Deborah and Baruch, who was um, a judge. So there is some history of the importance of this hill or mountain um, in Israel's history. Um, another uh, story related here is that 900 Canaanites chariots were swept away, um, apparently and uh, a flood happened. This would happen near Megiddo. And you have to, and uh, again, backing up a moment, if you go to this Church of the uh, Transfiguration, to the side of it, you can go up some stairs and get a beautiful view of the Galilee area, particularly of the plain of uh, Megiddo. And um, so there is, uh, the story there that the chariots of the Canaanites, it's a good story, a downpour occurred as they got to the foot of this mountain, clogged up the wheels of their chariots and the Israelites were able to uh, win the, the victory. All right, and there is more history connected with this particular spot, but um, all of this, again, is a little bit of background for the site of where the transfiguration of uh, Jesus to, uh, takes place. All right, now another point to notice here is that Matthew, and this is the gospel tradition that we're considering this time, Mark and Luke also have uh, the story of the transfiguration. It is not found in the fourth gospel, but it is found in the synoptic tradition. But Matthew alone uh, in, calls this a vision. Now, um, in a certain way, visions uh, indicate maybe what today we might call an alternate state of consciousness, that in some ways both Jesus maybe and his disciples, namely the three, uh, see things in um, a different way. All right. Now, the, the, what happens here is that uh, as they are on this uh, hill, Jesus is pictured as being uh, caught up in a bright cloud that engulfs also the uh, three disciples, Peter, James, and uh, John. Is this transformation or this transfiguration, seeing Jesus' inner reality and he shine, it shines forth what is within him in a way that transfigures um, his appearance. Jesus' face is pictured as shining brightly. Now there is an Old Testament, and keep in mind always that in this gospel tradition, Matthew continually presents Jesus as the new Moses. It, there was a story in a time in Israel's history that Moses, after he encountered God on a mountain, his face was so brilliant at times that the Israelites told him he had to put a veil on 
because he couldn't, uh, his face was so, so bright. So is this part of the kind of connection that the gospel writer is making with regard to Jesus as he appears here? Now, a brilliant cloud overcovers them. Now, you would think that a cloud would uh, be, because of the presence, would be brilliant, but instead it creates a shadow. And the shadow comes over the apostles. Now, um, so they are in a certain way involved in this whole um, experience. For God identifies, as we hear in the reading, Jesus as the Son of, uh, as the Son of God and gives authority to his teaching. Now those are two important things here. Jesus is God's Son and he is, his teaching, teachings are important and should be listening. Now, Jesus is pictured as conversing, as we've mentioned, with Moses and Elijah. Um, we don't know what they were saying, so Matthew does not tell us that. But a voice from the cloud speaks to the apostles. So this is interesting. And the apostles, so there's a dialogue now, apparently, with the, vo the, with the, the voice, which we, is God, uh, the same voice, of course, that came over uh, Jesus at the time of his baptism in the Jordan. And um, the response that the apostles makes to this voice um, who says, this is my beloved son, listen to him, is twofold. One, they would like to pro prolong Jesus' transfiguration and conversation. So they really kind of, this is something amazing. And secondly, they are eager to participate in this venture. So um, Peter now, as always in Matthew, emerges as the spokesperson, says it is wonderful that we are here. Let us build three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So this is their way to not only engage in whatever this event, uh, this wonderful event is, but also to prolong it, to kind of, all right, we'll build these tents and uh, we will uh, keep there. Now, some say that this event happened at the time of uh, one of the Jewish feasts of Sukkoth, when indeed the Israelites lived in tents, remind, reminding them of the journey years when they were in the wilderness and were tent people, and also that the tent, there was in Israel's uh, camp, a special tent dedicated to the presence of the Almighty, and the only one who would go into this would be Moses, and it was when Moses came out of this tent that his face was so illuminated, as I mentioned, that again, they asked him to put on a, uh, a mask. So all of this uh, is built perhaps into kind of a uh, understanding of this particular transfiguring event, certainly in a, <clears throat> a different way on the part of the apostles of seeing Jesus. So they get a clearer understanding of Jesus <clears throat> as the one. Now, keep in mind that the upcoming events in Jesus' life, his death, on the, uh, arrest and death are going to consider to be a shameful event. And um, perhaps this gives them a clearer understanding of Jesus as the one who lived on the brink of shame, but all the times will still be mastered in a position of favor with regard to the Father. So. What we will notice here, and one of the reasons perhaps by this apparition or story is told, is Jesus was indeed an honorable person whose activities were always pleasing to God. Jesus has a, a firm conviction that God will restore his honor by raising him from the dead. So now you can see in this transfiguring understanding of Jesus, in anticipation of the resurrection and how these two um, e events, namely his 
being seen in glory and his being raised in glory um, are uh, connected. So keep in mind also, as we've mentioned, that certainly this gospel was written in Matthew's time, and so therefore the resurrection is known, was experienced, and is part, of course, of Christian life by that time. So um, maybe putting all of that uh, together is uh, kind of an understanding of uh, this important event in the experience of the disciples and in the experience of, uh, of Jesus. The readings, um, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, in some ways are chosen to uh, obviously support the uh, transfiguration idea. Uh, the first, which is, comes from the book of Daniel. Now again, the book of Daniel um, has, uh, we believe is the last book, last recognized book in, by the Israelites or the Old Testament book written perhaps about 150 years before the common time and uh, is divided into two sections. The first six chapters deal with events in the uh, life of Daniel and then chapter seven to the end are what we would call apocalyptic views, okay, or eschatological views, a picture of what is coming. So even the way in which the book is constructed has uh, different ways of, in, of interpreting. So chapter seven, which is where the reading comes from this time, um, pictures one coming like the son of man or as a son of man or as a son of humanity. Now, what's uh, perhaps interesting to notice, this is verses nine through 10. Back up a moment to the verses which are missing, verses one through eight, pictures of these great creatures coming, um, powerful creatures, four of them, uh, coming and rising in the heavens, and now comes one who is as a man or as a human being. So that's where this one uh, picks up. Um, pictures the ancient one. Now, who is the ancient one? Well, we would assume that's God. Clothed with clothing bright as snow, hair white as wool, and of course, uh, the interpretations that are taking place here is white indicates purity. White hair, <laughs> I have to smile at this one, is generally considered to be belonging to an older um, person and is connected with wisdom. It's interesting that this image of the ancient one is sometimes taken over by later Christian writers as an image of God the Father. So this is one of the places perhaps where uh, this comes from. He, this ancient one comes riding on a throne uh, of flames of fire and um, with wheels that are burning. And that reminds one a little bit of the story connected with Elijah, the prophet whom you remember was taken up to heaven in a fiery chariot. So a lot of images go uh, to work here in uh, the Daniel book. One like a son of man. Now, of course, there's the word like which is uh, not the same as, or <laughs> use the same word, doesn't mean the same as, like means similar, but similar and same are of course two different understandings. And the like son of man comes riding on the clouds of heaven, of course. So again, this has that apocalyptic vision of a time uh, yet to come. So the point being here is that this figure like the Son of Man is a mysterious figure and is in installed by God as ruler over the whole universe. Um, he, and he will be given an everlasting kingdom and his kingdom belongs to earth. So uh, again, keeping in mind you have heaven, earth and uh, the underworld, here the kingdom that will be established 
belongs to uh, this world, to the earth. So why is that chosen? Well, again, you get all these uh, different uh, indications of light, splendor, magnificence, etc. Always uh, I have to smile, keep in mind that when we celebrate feasts, we look for readings that help us or are connected with the feast we're celebrating. So you can see why this one is chosen because it has something to do with light and illumination and glory. And then the uh, second reading, which comes from the letter of, uh, attributed to Peter, one of the last letters uh, written in the New Testament, one of three known as the pastoral letters. Well, uh, no, this one stands by, by itself. Um, seems to, and it, it's a little more difficult to in, interpret, speaks of something extraordinary which is going to happen. Um, that could this really happen? The author is determined to say, oh yes, it, it did happen. Um, it happened already, but it will happen again. And why, says the writer of this letter, do I know that it happened? Because I was an eyewitness. So it's interesting, uh, the viewpoint that, that is uh, being taken here. And um, why do I know that? Because I was on the mountain there when it ha happened. Notice that this is uh, a letter attributed to Peter. So therefore, was Peter the, the author of this? Well, obviously not, but it's written in the Patrine uh, tradition. And um, I noticed this, but also, see, so although he is transfigured and in a way has come, he will also come again in a glory. So um, th th this reading again reminds us that light comes out of darkness, that indeed with the Lord there is the dawning of a new day, a new day, of course, is this yet-to-be event, and that when this new day comes, there will be the rising of the morning star. So a, a number of interesting images are used here. The idea of a star over Israel um, reminds one also of a story that's found in the uh, book of, uh, <clears throat> in the Pentateuch books, in which the Moabite uh, prophet Balaam, who was hired <laughs> to curse the Jews by the uh, Moabites, uh, finds himself from time to time as he tries to curse the Israelites, giving them a blessing. And the point here uh, of this uh, perhaps reference on the part of Matthew is that uh, the <clears throat> Balaam says, a star shall shine shall shine out or shall come out of Jacob. So is this, therefore, all of this an illusion as we uh, hear to um, the coming of Jesus? So on this particular feast, as I say, with its history and which its place, we remember the graciousness of God in transfiguring Jesus and in when we uh, celebrate transfiguring um, us. There's a certain irony as this particular feast is uh, observed on the 6th of August, that in the year 1945, on this very day, August the 6th, a new kind of light came into the world, a destructive light, when for the first time over the Jew Japanese city of Hiroshima, the atomic bomb was dropped, for the for, was dropped on that city and brought a light, all right, and we've all seen pictures of the cloud that emerged when that bomb was dropped. But it, it transfigured, if you want, or transformed a city into destruction. And so there's a kind of irony here that on this day, the modern world dropped the first atomic bomb, and three days later, over the, again, Japanese city of Nagasaki, dropped the second bomb, bringing not life, but death, bringing a light, 
and a warning rather than a light of comfort and support. Well, as uh, we keep this day, may the Lord's light truly shine on all. Thank you for being with us. Hope to see you again.